Hello everybody and welcome to the Filipino Freethinkers podcast that's also a video. I'm Red. I'm Guy, Silvia Estrada Claudio, director of this center that's celebrating its 25th anniversary, the UP Center for Women's Studies. I'm Lelo Claudio, I'm her son. And I'm also from the Filipino Freethinkers. Yes, and today is a special day we're celebrating, as Guy said, the 25th Fifth anniversary. And also it's a special day for all of the RH advocates in the Philippines because today we reached a milestone, today last year, of the RH bill passed second reading in Congress for the first time. So those are the two things that we're celebrating. And also one thing that a lot of people here in the, at the Center for Women's Studies can celebrate is the recent mainstreaming of feminism in media. Like there was that commercial, have you seen that? Of course you've seen that, the Pantene ad. It's been making the rounds on social media. Even other countries are taking notice. And a lot of websites like Jezebel and Skeptic have been taking on feminism as one of the main topics that they keep discussing. And there have been popular discussions about whether Kim Kardashian, for example, or Miley Cyrus are unsung feminist heroes. So these are the things that I'd like to talk about. And hopefully by the end of this discussion, the the microphone, there you go, divine intervention. So hopefully by the end of this discussion, you would have known the recent updates about the, the feminist scene. Is there such a scene, Leloy? I don't know. I think <laughs> the mainstreaming started with Wannabe. You know, you remember that? Girl Power. There Spice you go. Girls. Okay, so it started with the Spice Girls, apparently. And Miley Cyrus is just uh, following that trend that they started. So let, let's begin. Let's talk about that Pantene ad. What did you think about it? <laughs> I haven't seen the Pantene ad. You haven't seen so, the Pantene ad. I've been so busy recently, but I know it's all over social media. Yeah. And it's one of those things so, so it's on my bucket list. Like, I'll see it today, but I keep forgetting to see it. Because, but let me tell you, there's a, there's a legitimate excuse why I haven't seen it. This is for the thought. But I think it's largely because I've, I've grown very disillusioned with sort of popular mainstream feminism. You know, I talk about it in jest, but you, you look at something like Wannabe, and um, you know, everybody said that that represented the mainstream of feminism. And that led to things like, for instance, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and all these girl power shows during the 90s. And I'm, I'm just slightly cynical about it. Um, Oh, I'm not cynical about Buffy, it's the greatest thing that ever, that's ever existed. <laughs> but generally, I'm very cynical about um, girl power because it's, it's a very decontextualized kind of feminism. It's so, oh, also obviously a very commercial feminism. And obviously if it's a Pantene ad, it's using feminism to sell something. But uh, I mean, if you talk about feminism, I mean, the kind of feminism I subscribe to is a it's kind of feminism that takes into consideration sort of material conditions of women. And um, the kind of girl power factors in the mainstream in the 90s largely appealed to sort of corporate execs um, breaking the glass ceiling. It's not bad, but that's a, that's a very different kind of feminism from the feminism that I'm used to and the feminism that we need in the context of a country in the global south like the Philippines. So you keep on mentioning the feminism that, I'm, that I subscribe to. So it implies that there are many kinds of feminism and that's one thing that we will talk about, but but let's start with the, the let's use the Pantene ad as a jump off point for the discussion. So you've seen the, the, the ad. <laughs> you haven't. But I, so the, I will I will reenact it right now. Okay. Go. So no, I'm kidding. I can't do that. But anyway, it's just um, one man like doing something. Let's say giving a speech, yeah. right? And the there's a label there that says something like persuasive. Okay, and then they, they jump cut to a woman doing the same thing, let's say giving the same speech, and then the label becomes pushy. Pushy, that, and then th throughout the commercial they keep on repeating that. Uh, a, a woman giving her subordinates commands is, I mean the, a man giving the subordinates commands is called the boss. And when it's a woman, it becomes bossy. Right? And then one weird thing that I, I remember from the commercial is they were both washing their faces in front of a mirror in the bathroom. When it was a man, the man it's a uh, neat. And when it's the woman, it's vain. So I think that was kind of inaccurate in the context of... But anyway, the, the general message of the commercial is that there are double standards 
that in society and the woman is usually on the losing end of that. And, and I think one of the things that people could take issue with is that the woman is usually that, you know, the stereotypical beautiful woman with the long hair and with a clear skin and when the, with the slender figures. So having heard about it from me, I'm sure you'll watch it after this. Like, what, what's your impression of it? Like, uh, or that certain direction of uh, feminism? It's really funny how uh, corporate uh, popular culture, and I don't know if you can put, that's sort of an oxymoron, but corporate or ads, uh, which we nonetheless appreciate because uh, media itself has been subject to a lot of criticism because of their um, continuing reinforcement of really bad gender stereotypes. Uh, uh, and I would include stereotypes against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people, which is also a, a, a concern, right? Um, so, it, so on the other hand, it, the glass is always half empty and half full in, in the way I'm thinking because these assault on the stereotypical roles of men and women and the double standard. This has been the fem one of the feminist uh, points of analysis 40 years back. And you see it now in a panty commercial and it's, it's, it's as if it's so new and so wonderful. It's a little bit like free thinking. I mean, one of the things we do in free thinking is to insist on the respect for the opinions and culture of everyone to say that there are people who don't have a religion and they do have a right to freedom of non-belief. But that, and we've been saying that, I guess for centuries, and yet, um, and so when, 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 if we ever saw a commercial that said this, you and I would be jumping up and down in joy, you know, the cup is full, yeah. it's half full. But then we'd sit back and we say, but, you know, long. it took us that long, and that's like free thinking 101, yeah. right? It's, it's not even college, that's free thinking elementary. Yeah. And there is so much more to feminism and so much more to free thinking than just the initial uh, or one little piece of it. And that, that's how one would see many of these expressions in popular culture. Yes, we're happy to have influenced the discussion, influenced it to such a degree that a, corp a big corporate thing, uh, entity would put this out, but did it take us that long and it remains, can we go beyond this? to more deep issues is really, is really the question that we have at hand, right? Exactly. Uh, let's, let's talk about... Hello, there. Let's talk about going beyond this. So people will see this commercial and they will recognize that these things actually do happen. And they, they will agree with it and they will think, yeah, I, I think we shouldn't be unfair to women. We shouldn't call them bossy when they're just being the boss or pushy when they're just being persuasive and doing their jobs, we shouldn't do this. And then somebody talking to them will say, ah, so would you think that, would you call yourself a feminist now? And then, oh, I wouldn't go that far. No, 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 I'm not part of that, that group. I'm not a feminist. I, I agree that we should be fair to women, but I'm not a feminist. So this is one of the barriers that I think we need to tackle if we are to go beyond that 101 level. Now, why do you think that that exists, that hesitation to identify as a feminist, you know, what, what brought us to this point and how do you think we could go past it? There's this uh, scene in Borat where Borat visits the feminists, right? And he asks them questions like, what is a feminism? <laughs> and, and they give very, very standard feminist responses, like, you know, it's the belief that women are fundamentally equal to men and he goes what and, you know and, and but you know it's a very standard kind of feminism but what's striking about that video is obviously the comedy but more than that is the fact that those feminists were actually quite dogmatic about their beliefs and when they were listening to Borat obviously Borat is an extreme but they were very intolerant of his positions of course those were crazy positions and he was testing the limit but the fact that they were so judgmental and that they were talking about these things as if they were completely self-evident to somebody from a, a different culture I think just belies some of the traits of any activist organization or any group of um, people who think ideologically 
about um, the inability to, to bridge that gap. Um, and, and it's that image, I think, whether or not it's warranted or not, it's that image of the angry bra burning feminist from the 1970s that's preventing the, these people from appreciating the depth of that discourse. I'm not saying that's fair, right? I'm not saying that's fair, but, but I think there are still some of those stereotypes in the back of the minds of these people. Um, I think one of the, the, the things that uh, feminism has brought, including uh, what sometimes we call third wave feminism, you know, the feminism of the younger uh, women uh, category I don't belong to, but I think what, what it brings is this acceptance of identity and your ability and your right to, to name yourself. So, uh, that would include being able to say, yes, I'm a feminist, uh, and I would do that now, the drop of a hat or the drop of a podcast. Um, I guess I'm a free thinker, I'm an agnostic, and I say that now at the drop of a podcast. But it also is about if you don't want to name yourself this way, then that's fine as well. I think it relates to the question of um, what poli the politics of identity, and really one of the insights is if it's a liberatory politics, then we have to express our multiple, we have the freedom to make those identities, the freedom to use them, and the freedom to express the multiplicity of identities that we are. So I am a professor, but I'm also an activist. I'm a feminist, but I'm also a free thinker. And many women will have different positioning. I'm a worker and a lesbian. I'm a, I'm a professor and I'm gay. You know, there's so many other identity positions and we cannot ask people to live in only one of them because then we get into this ossified sort of um, monolithic, monolithic uh, position that, that Borat was was so clearly, um, what do you call it, laughing at. So that's the first. Uh, and yes, there's a backlash against feminism and that's bad. And the reason why the backlash gets taken on is precisely because we keep calling ourselves out on our identities instead of understanding that allowing a multiplicity of identities to speak within a social movement is possibly the more revolutionary of the ways of, of doing social transformation. Yeah, having said that, um, it's also a question of, it's also a very context specific question, like who can say they're feminist or not. Like, in very liberal contexts, and I'll admit that academia where I'm situated in, you know, the, the right wing is actually correct, it is actually very liberal, and that's good. Um, but sort of many academic spheres, context, you don't even talk about feminism because it's one of those big assume. Like if you are in an academic conference or there are progressive academics, we don't really even theorize what it means to be a feminist or you don't even ask the question because it was so 1980s or you know, you, you grappled with that question when Gloria, Gloria Steinem was still cool. But now it's just sort of like, cool that's it. She's not cool anymore. Um, you should see that movie, The To-Do List. Gloria Steinem is still cool. Okay. okay. They, they're bringing her back. Okay. Yeah, okay. Bring her back. Yeah, but, but that's it. It's a soup. And, and that's sort of what it's been like for me. I mean, I grew up with this person as a mother. And then this I've been person. just like shifting from liberal context, from one liberal context to another. And, and now I just don't even talk about it. It's just an assume. So you talked about feminism being an assume, but I think a lot of people have assumptions about feminism. So let's finally get to it. What is feminism? What is the bare minimum? Where do you draw the line? I'm, I'm sure when you said, you know, when, when you explained how feminism was not a monolith, that we should, of course, allow people to have a, allow there to be a multiplicity of voices within the social movement of feminism. But then again, there you can go over the line. I mean, you can say, okay, that thing is definitely not feminism. So let's uh, let's set the boundaries. So where do we start? Like feminism, like the, the bare minimum, and where is where do we draw the line? That's clearly no longer feminism anymore. And uh, this is again, it, it was it's brought up by people like uh, Kim Kardashian or Miley Cyrus being called unsung feminist heroes by some people in the social sphere. So yeah, what is feminism, guys? We should go. Okay. Well, th there's this sort of standard definition and I, I, I will give it out given that we've already all had all these questions 
about standard defi uh, definitions, but it is the recognition that women as a group are oppressed because they're women. Mm -hmm. they're, they they have a diff they are they are, they don't have the same privilege and access to power and resources as men as a group, and the the action to change that to join. Uh, in some action in order to change that. So that used to be a minimum. But my minimum has changed because I really think that we should consider issues of class. Uh, when, so it is the recognition that women and the poor uh, and marginalized ethnicities and groups and racists and free thinkers uh, are oppressed and these oppressions are inter intertwined and that you are doing your job for social transformation. So, if they had my own definition, my own bottom line is, is my bottom line. But again, I will go back to, if, if what you're saying is, I cannot relate to feminism except that I relate to it through my two identities as a poor woman and a woman, and, no, and that's how I come to feminism. And as a Filipina working in UP, I really don't see many racial issues in UP coming to play, so it doesn't come into my ordinary day, then I, I think that that's fine, even if my bottom line might be different from this person. So if many people are reading into Miley Cyrus and Kim Kardashian, certain aspirations for themselves as women and their desire to become more equal to society, I have no, I have no argument. So really, uh, what I will add to the bottom line is the politics of inclusivity that I would include as part of uh, feminist free thinking politics. By, by the way, some of it is not unsung. Like Joss Whedon is explicitly made Buffy a feminist show and he'll admit that. So just another plug for the greatest <laughs> show ever put on television. <laughs> Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and I think there's there's real feminism there uh, beyond the superficial feminism. But for me, um, the bare minimum of feminism, I'll take it from a relatively academic point of view, is using gender as a lens for analysis. Um, and when I talk, when I think about political thinking, in order for it to not ossify into an ideology, I usually think of political ideals or political goals as lenses. So when you put on a pair of glasses, you see something different. You put on beer glasses, everybody's hot. You put rose-tinted glasses on, you're always in love. Um, so, so the question then becomes, if I put on the lens of feminism, what do I see? So for instance, you're looking at an export processing zone. You put on the lens of Marxism, or you put on the lens of class analysis. And what you'll see is that the people there are oppressed because they come from a lower class, or, and they don't own the means of production. You'll see that. Uh, so you put on the lens of feminism and you'll see that a lot of these people are knitting because they're women because people perceive that women uh, knit better than men and that you can pay women less than men because their income is auxiliary relative to men. Um, so these lenses don't necessarily preclude each other. You can put multiple lenses on and you and you see different things. And um, if you think about it as you know just a filter filter through which you see social life and not as an ideology that constrains you, then I think it's a very liberating political position to have. So you both have mentioned that you can wear different lenses. You're not limited to just one. You can in be inclusive of other social movements as you consider gender issues. So it's, it's liberating in that you don't have to be one thing, and if you don't fit that mold, then you're definitely not a feminist. Someone can just understand the basics and start from there. So let's, let's start with going beyond the awareness that there is the glass ceiling or that there is a, that women are oppressed, that they're at a disadvantage. What are the first few things that someone who recognizes these issues, uh, what can they do beyond being aware of it or beyond raising awareness of it? Like what are the, some concrete things that someone who has finally decided that I'm going to take up take up the cost, however little I can contribute. It's not going to be a drop in the bucket. Uh, I, I believe that I will make a positive contribution in the long run. So what can people like this start to do? Well, um, coming from second wave feminism, my answer would be organized. You can join a group. You can work for an issue. For example, uh, very simply, do you in, if, you, if you're, do you have a sexual harassment policy or committee in wherever you are, you're working. It's as simple. It can be as simple a step as that. You know. So.
so um, you can decide to uh, work for the join the next rally uh, for I think we're going to try universal health care or we might have to just go to the to the Supreme Court one night last time for the RH bill. Are we going to law rather? Are we going to talk about other sexual reproductive rights issues? Are you going to join the Pride March next time, regardless of what your sexual orientation is? Are you going to work with the Filipino free thinkers to make that link between free thinking and feminism? Because you cannot be a feminist unless you're critical of the cultural norms that you inherited. So there are so many things that one can simply do. So, you know, it sounds cliche, but my answer is get out there and start organizing. One way to start organizing is to spot the misogynist and to organize against the misogynist. So it can be as simple as there's a sexual harasser in your office, right? or there's a boss that continually promotes men over women, or it's just people who are blokey and who drink a lot and in those drinks make a lot of wisecracks about the, the hot girl in the office, or the ugly girl, as the case may be. Um, that's one way to organize. Or you can find a misogynist in the Senate, and there is one major, major misogynist in the Senate, and his name is Tito Soto. And you know, I think to organize around Tito Soto's sexism, the person who continually wants to deny women reproductive rights, the person who believes that his God is pro-male, and the person who believes that maternal mortality isn't happening, and the person who's just not very smart, actually. To organize around Soto is already kind of feminism. To organize around it really is a kind of feminism. I mean, I'm just using them as examples, but you know, there are so many misogynists there. We can let them get away with what they're doing. I think that we, it would be a nice point to end at that remembering or seeing Soto for who he is, which is really the feminist bigot, uh, the, the worst feminist bigot we've ever had in government. Is that an overstatement? Yeah, like it might well, be. It's not the, I mean, it might be in the sense that um, it, it wouldn't be patriarchy if there was only one that we could point to as worst. Yeah, but, but it would be certainly one of the worst. One of the worst. Okay, yeah, let's leave it at that. Quite a number of uh, expletive deleted <laughs> out there. So, Guy Leloy, thank you so much Thanks, for sir. for joining me fun. in this uh, Filipino Free Thinkers podcast. That's also a video and happy. 25th anniversary to the anniversary Center month. for Women's Studies and happy passing on second reading of uh, the RH it's, Bill. It's let's continue say. the fight. Let's, um, let's be vigilant and be feminists. Thank you very much. See you next time.